Hi and welcome to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast for athletes, coaches and professionals who want to achieve their goals faster. I'm David Charlton and I'll be sharing proven methods from leading athletes, coaches and experts that will help you get the most from your talent. Today's show is sponsored by Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosforth, near Newcastle upon Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. Right, so today's guest is Chris Paisley. He's a professional golfer currently playing on the European Tour. First appearance on the tour was in 2010, I believe. Is that right? Uh, yep. yep, that's yep. right. You had a bumpy ride for a few years before regaining your card in for the 2015 season, I believe, where you've established yourself since. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Excellent. And then in January 2018, you had your first win on the tour it's in the South African Open. And arguably, some would say you were the best golfer on the planet that month as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for one month, there was world number one. <laughs> <laughs> I think plenty of golfers around the planet would uh, would like to have that on that CV. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so when we're talking about winning, there, do you want to just tell me what it is that golfers need to well, firstly win once on the on the European Tour, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the big thing starts with the the skill side of it. Um, you know, since the whole like strokes gain thing came out with Mark Brody, like the way I like to look at it is obviously to get to to whatever level to get the world number one, you effectively your strokes gained needs to add up to whatever it is, plus three overall. So, and there's obviously a lot of ways you can do that. So, you know, a guy like Dustin Johnson gains a ton of strokes with his driving. You know, he hits it miles and he hits it pretty straight. So he's you know effectively you know, gained a massive advantage over a lot of people with that. And then then you got the guys that hit it really straight and put well. And and no matter how you do it, um, it's just all about kind of what your skills add up to. And that's obviously you need that kind of that ability and that skill to to be able to shoot the scores needed to to win a golf tournament. Um, and obviously, there's, there's certain elements that are more kind of important, not more important, but are easier to make gains than others. Like like driving, for example. Um, I think like the best drivers in the world gain you know, three or four strokes around, um, whereas the best putters only gain maybe one. So you know where your strengths lie. Strengths lie is obviously really important, but. Um, yeah, so it's just about your your game adding up to a, a certain level, and then then eventually, um, you know, that win will come if if you're good enough. Um, so to do it once, you know, I think you know anyone can, not anyone, but if you've got a certain level of ability, then you sh- there's also a good chance you can win a tournament just through that. And then I think the you know how you then win again is um, obviously continually improving those skills, but it then goes to the kind of the mental side and um how good your processes are and how well you handle adversity and how well you can handle pressure of playing in big tournaments and, and trying to win and and all that side of it but um yeah i think for me just i always have had the the approach of you know just trying to improve my game all the time and i think that's you can kind of see from my career that it's been a obviously there's been bumps in there but you know i've slowly improved over you know the, the 10 years that i've been pro and then that kind of Eventually, my game and kind of mindset got to the point which allowed me to to win in the South African Open, and um, it wasn't just kind of one thing that um, caused that. It was an improvement of the skills that I've got, and um, you know, my ability to handle pressure and and all that stuff. And okay, some yeah, some great points there. <clears throat> I remember a good few years back when Tiger was number one consistently for for a good few years. He got slaughtered by I don't know whether that was Paul Azinger for basically turning around saying when he approaches a tournament he's there to win yeah is that is that like something that like crosses your mind when you when you're playing regularly at all when you you know before the tournament yeah I think that's something that separates the best players to be honest and I would say for me that is something that it could get a lot better at um I think for me yeah when when I feel like I'm playing pretty well um in a in a good place with my game and stuff uh I do think about I do think about winning. You know, I know that I have the ability to win, especially since I've won. But I think the the best players, like Tiger, for example, like it didn't matter if he was playing terrible or you know playing his best golf, he was there to win. Um, and I think that just feeds it just feeds your daily habits. So if if winning is all that's on your mind, then 
almost subconsciously you're going to do things in your practice and in your preparation a little bit better than someone that's just there to try and make a cut or have a top 10. Um, and I've been guilty of that in the past, you know, um, it's easy to kind of just be happy to be playing decent golf and, and make cuts and, you know, make a living where the best players, all, all they're interested in is, is winning. They don't, you know, if they're not quite on the game that week, it doesn't really bother them because they're not going to win and that doesn't matter. And the weeks where they're on, you know, that they are there to win. And, um, and I think it just, that attitude just filters into to how you do things. And um, maybe I think it just improves your focus in, in your practice. Maybe that 1% that makes a difference. And, and that, I think that's something that happened in before South Africa for me. Uh, I had five weeks off in Orlando and, and we were just really focused on having a great start of the season and, and getting a win. And, and my kind of level of focus that five weeks prior was just a notch higher than it ever had been before. Do you want to tell us how that was? Yeah, I think it was interesting. Um, came down to some silly little things like so basically we decided that Kerry was going to caddy for me that week and um in the whole build-up she would kind of jokingly say when I left in the morning to go and practice she'd be like make sure you have a good practice because we're going to win in South Africa and um and I just think I just had this kind of higher level of determination focus and without really realizing it at the time you know I was I would get to the course and just my level of focus was just that notch higher that over that five week period just added up and um there was obviously a lot of other factors you know there's obviously rubber the green goes into winning tournaments and stuff but i think i went into that week with kind of feeling great about my preparation but you know with having carry on the bag my expectations were kind of i was quite relaxed about it all but my kind of level of performance is really high so it was just a really nice combination of, of kind of things to to kind of make me feel relaxed and confident throughout the week um without like you know, getting too caught up in in the result of it all and um it's e- it's easy as as golfers to because it is such a long term sport that it's easy just to kind of you know stick with the process. My game will cover eventually, blah blah blah. But I think there is an element of you do have to kind of have that killer instinct and that extra drive and determination and practice because there's a lot of guys trying to make a living and trying to win tournaments. And if if you just kind of go about things in a in a so so way, then you're just not gonna beat a lot of people. Um, that's something I've tried to really do over the last few years is just try and practice better than anyone else. Not, not necessarily more than other people, but just make my practice ultra focused, ultra kind of efficient. And, um, and hopefully that is going to kind of lead to some good results, you know? Yeah. Some, again, some great points. You talked there about like being relaxed. I'm guessing you went relaxed on the back nine when you're approaching that win. It's funny. Like I, I was though, it was, um, like it's the old cliche, take it one shot at a time. Um, I was so focused on what I needed to do to hit good shots that that was all that was on my mind. And I kind of almost had a feeling of inevitability that I was going to win because I think my, my swing was in a good place. I was putting well. My, I kind of had a really good mindset that week and I just did a really good job of focusing on the, the only things that mattered. So I had, I had some kind of swing thoughts and stuff that week and I just knew that if I focus on that, I would hit good shots and any other hit good shots, then I was going to be hard to beat. And so oddly enough, it was one of the most, once I was on the course, it was one of the most kind of relaxed mindsets I've ever been in. And I think it goes back to kind of that, you know, a lot of people say that trying to make cuts is a lot harder than trying to win golf tournaments. Cause when, you know, that week my game was in great shape where pretty much where I aimed was where the ball went, which is always a nice feeling. Whereas, um, you know, when you're around the cut mark, that isn't quite the case. And, and it's just a bit harder to be, you know, relaxed when you're kind of, you're just not quite on your game. So it was funny that the whole build up to the last round in South Africa, I was nervous as anything. You know, I could barely eat the night before and the morning of, and I just couldn't wait to get out on the course because it was just that horrible feeling of waiting. But once I got on the range, even I was, that was, I was in my kind of, my own bubble and in, in my arena, so to speak. And, and oddly enough, I was, um, I was just really relaxed the whole day. That's great. In a way, the way you described it on the back nine, there it sounds like you are. When I mentioned the zone, you were, you were there. You you found it. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, it was total flow state. It was just, um, I knew what I needed to do. You know, I was just trying to execute it as well as possible. And um, yeah, I think, I think the that's another thing that separates the best players is they can get in that zone more than other people. You know, it's not easy to do, but um, you know, we we watched Tiger do for twenty odd years and. Um, yeah, it's just it's just that ability to focus on the things that matter. And you know, if I'd become 
distracted by, you know, Brandon starting Birdie Eagle or like the crowd were actually quite rowdy that day. And, you know, anytime he did anything good, they were, you know, they were screaming his name. And when I was doing, when I was making birdies, they weren't particularly happy. So I could have, I could have easily become distracted by that. And, um, but I wasn't, I was just totally in my own world, focusing on the things I needed to focus on. And it's such a cliche, but that is, um, if you could kind of have one skill as a golfer, I would say the ability to focus on one thing and nothing else, it was probably more important than anything. Did you catch yourself in the last few holes at all thinking about winning or lifting the trophy or anything like that, your speech? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, a little bit. I think when I hold, was it the 15th, the 15th hole, the par five, I hold like an eight footer, I think to like maintain a three shot lead. Because then I kind of thought, I'm not going to screw this up now. <laughs> I kind of wasn't really aware I could lose. And I think I kind of let myself think about it for a second, but then by the time I got to the 16 tee box, it was kind of back in that zone. And it wasn't really till, till I hit my shot on the green on the last that then I knew it was done, you know, because I think I had a two, you know, three shot lead playing 18 and um, there's always a chance you can make a double and he makes a, a birdie. So, but I hit a good tee shot and then um, I hit my second shot on the green and that's kind of when I let, let myself relax. But I would say up until, all the way up until the, that put one in on 15, I hadn't thought about it at all. It was just purely you know, focusing on the next shot and, and what, I, what I needed to think to hit a good shot. Interesting one, that, because if you, if you speak to many good club golfers even, and, and I'm sure professionals as well, they, they can get caught up, you know, think, mm. thinking too far ahead of themselves. It sounds like, obviously, you've caught yourself when you've, when you've thought ahead, then you've just managed to switch right back into right next shot, that, that one-shot mentality. Yeah. Um, what, I've, what I've noticed, certainly with people I've worked with, when they think ahead, they might start beating themselves up because they're thinking ahead, which <clears> isn't uh, isn't a helpful thing at all to do because it's it's just perfectly natural, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh, I mean, I, and I've done it. You know, I've kind of probably cost myself it. Maybe not tournaments, but better finishes because you get excited about potentially finishing a top three or a top five or whatever. And I remember um, flying around in Denmark in like 2016 or 17. You know, I was in the last group and. I totally wasn't in that one shot at a time mentality and um, ended up shooting like a 78 and finishing 35th. And you know, my game was great that week, but just through a lapse of kind of focus, you know, I totally imploded. And um, yeah, it's, it's such an important skill to be able to develop. And some people kind of seem to be able to do it quite naturally and, and others have to work at it a bit more. And certainly something that I've got a lot better at over the years is just focus on what you can control and kind of one or two important things that you need to do to hit good shots just just do that and and nothing else is relevant so how do you train it how do you develop it um a good example so before south africa i was doing a lot of um what i call punishment practice so but basically i chatted with uh nico my coach and andy and kind of found that like my game in practice and like away from tournaments was brilliant and on the range was brilliant but then i was getting the tournaments and just i just wasn't the same player I think a lot of it was to do with that, you know, when I was, when you're in practice and on the range, it's, it's easier to focus on whatever it is you, you're trying to focus on. But when you get into tournaments, all, it's, all of a sudden you've got a scorecard and there's crowds and there's tough holes with water and, and your attention kind of starts to wander without you realizing. So we came up, we tried to basically come up with a plan where my practice was going to be as close as possible to tournament play. So try to figure out what would get me nervous during practice. So came up with the idea of doing for example would do like a, a 10 ball track man test and if I didn't score above whatever it was say 90 points then I had to do a punishment so it'd be stuff like doing 20 press-ups on the range and the thought of like me practicing around the range with people around me and not passing that test and then dropping down and doing 20 press-ups in front of everyone was just like I just didn't want to have to do that just because of the embarrassment factor so I found like I would be on the last shot, you know, one of these tests kind of on the bubble and I'd be really nervous because like if I hit a good one, I'm all right. But if I hit a bad one, I'm going to have to drop down and, you know, do lunges or press ups or whatever it was in it. And it got those nerves going for me. And um, so then as the five weeks progressed, like I messed a few tests up early on because I would get nervous and I would get distracted and I would hit a bad shot. But then as that, as those weeks went on, I kind of just got much better at I've got to hit a good drive here else I'm doing 20 press-ups. So what do I need to focus on? And it was stuff like wait in your transition a bit longer because I would tend to get a bit, because I got a bit nervous, I would get a bit quick and 
he had a bad t-shirt or whatever. And it, it was just, I worked out all these little feelings and cues and thoughts that really helped me hit good shots when I started to feel a bit nervous. And then, then I went into South Africa and you usually have this kind of period when you've had a long break of almost getting back to match fitness and you, you usually make all these kind of dumb mental errors. And, and I was just, I was kind of razor sharp from, from the start. And uh, yeah, it's, that's the, that's the way I, I know how to kind of train it is to, to basically get yourself out of your comfort zone and, and find ways to put pressure on yourself. And then, and then you learn you know, how to deal with it basically. I like that because yeah, it is really difficult, isn't it? To, to be able to practice, like you say, under pressure and then, and then transfer it across to, to tournament golf. Yeah, absolutely. Let's face it. A lot of people struggle with it massively. Yeah. yeah and even more recently we've uh, came up with a bit of a plan with uh, Kerry that, so I've been playing some matches against lads at the golf club, you know, we'll just play for $20 or whatever. And I found I would, I would just kind of play and not really be particularly into it. Um, you know, cause like the money, whether you take $20 or lose $20 isn't like enough motivation basically. So, um, I said, if I basically decided if I lose a match, then I've got to go for a mile run afterwards. Um, and I hate running. I've got short stumpy legs and I'm not built for running. So, yeah. I had a couple of matches with one of the lads that, Lake Nona and I lost the first two days and had to come back. You know, it's like 95 degrees over here. I've just practiced all day and, and have to go and run a mile as fast as I can. And uh, it was miserable. So I think I've gone like three matches in Pete now because I'm so desperate. And, and I generally found that um, my level of focus improved because I was just so desperate not to go for a mile run afterwards that like I was doing whatever I could to try and beat the guy, you know? I love that one. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's That'll be a problem a lot of golfers will actually have at the at the moment as well because mm. let's face it, well, certainly in the UK, they've been back for three weeks at this point when we're interviewing and there hasn't been any competitive golf. Yeah. Professionally, obviously, the tour doesn't open up for another six weeks or so. So, yeah, people will be going around, focus will be at about 3% and they'll be, they'll be yeah. really relaxed. Yeah, so do press up, so go for a big run after <laughs> as a yeah, punishment to yourself. Whatever whatever gets you nervous like and it's a hard thing to do to kind of get put yourself out of your comfort zone and um but it's something i just thought was really important and necessary and and that's why like i had i didn't enjoy doing all that stuff but i just thought it was too important you know um and it, and it really really helped yeah thanks for sharing that so we go back to the conversation when we're talking about winning there you've mentioned on numerous occasions the best players will be able to win when they're not playing well and mm. that's potentially something you've you've struggled with at times. How do you deal with that when you're not playing well on tour and obviously trying to be successful? Yeah, it's it's something that I've got a lot better at. Yeah, again, it's something I've talked with with Nico and, and Andy about a lot is being able to just you know when you're not on is just to make cuts and and make a living. And obviously for the for the top boys, that's not really relevant because you know the the financial side isn't important, and they and they know they're gonna kind of win majors and, and that kind of stuff. Whereas for, for 99% of golfers, you know, it's important to be able to you know, get the most out of yourself when you're, you're not at your best. And um, so for me, for me personally, I think what the important thing was kind of managing expectations. So past I found even when I wasn't playing well, I was still trying to hit perfect shots and, and trying to swing it perfectly. And I almost have this stubbornness, you know, usually I like to hit a nice kind of a soft draw with my driver. And sometimes when I'm my swing's a bit out, I struggle to hit that because I get a bit stuck. And if I try and hit that that shot, I can kind of hit it all over the place. And but I'd, I'd stubbornly try and hit this kind of perfect high draw, um, even though I kind of didn't really have it in my locker. And that probably cost me quite a few mis mis cuts over the years. And I think what I've managed to do recently is kind of just develop like B and C kind of plans and strategies. And and now like if I'm struggling off the tee, for example, I've, I've kind of worked on stuff like teeing the ball down and hitting a low fade is kind of a shot that I've become a lot better at. And it's kind of hard on your ego. Like you, you feel like you're hitting a skanky little fade down the fairway and you're losing maybe 15, 20 yards of distance. And it's a hard thing to do, but it's, you know, in certain situations when your game's not quite on it, it's a really important skill to have. And, um, and you, you see Tiger do that really well. Um, you know, when he's not on, he get, you know, he used to get his stinger two iron out and he still kind of shapes the ball and, so a good example recently was Qatar, the last tournament before the lockdown. Um, I was hitting the ball pretty rubbish and we were on the range on the Tuesday and I was videoing my swing and trying to work out what was going on and I was 
trying to hit these perfect shots and it just wasn't happening. And I just turned around to Jason McCaddy and said, like, if I try and go into this week, try and fix my swing and hit perfect shots, I just know we just haven't got enough time to do that before the tournament starts. And I just know I'm going to play crap. So, so what we're going to do is just every shot, just be really committed to hitting a, a big shape, no matter what it is. And so we're on the range and I just, he said to me, all right, now hit like a 10 yard fade with your driver. And I hit this perfect 10 yard fade. And we got a seven iron out and he said, all right, now hit a low draw. And I hit a perfect low draw. And we hit all these different shots. And I think just because all of a sudden I'd become on, become focused on the, the kind of ball flight and the target, that took my kind of awareness away from my swing. And I started to hit all these really nice shots and start to get a bit of confidence. And, um, and that's what we did that week out in the course is just every shot, just be really committed to a certain shape. And, um, and I ended up finishing like seventh or ninth or whatever it was that week um, from going from playing like terrible, you know, in the buildups the week to then hitting all these really nice kind of shaped shots. And, um, you know, when I won in South Africa, I was just, I was hitting it dead straight and I kind of, you know, I wasn't really shaping the ball at all because my swing was in a good place and where I was looking was where the ball was going, but it's not always like that. And, um, yeah, I think for me, a good strategy when I'm not quite on it is just to, to hit big shapes. And I just find that kind of takes my focus away from my golf swing and, and puts it into, it's almost kind of like bubble type golf, you know, where he just sees a shot and just tries to hit it. Um, and it's, it's not how I like to play all the time, but in certain circumstances, it, it works really well. I would imagine if you're trying to be perfect and have, have the perfect swing, you're potentially going to try too hard. So yeah. you're going to be a little bit tense. Whereas yeah. if you yeah, if you're trying to shape it, you're seeing different shots, you're going to be a little bit more relaxed, aren't you? And probably your yeah. timing comes back. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I've always been kind of, always been someone that enjoys kind of working on my swing and, and getting it right and stuff. And I think there are times when I've, I've played my best golf and I've been obviously, obviously swinging it well, but like kind of been more technically orientated. But there's certain times when, you know, your swing's just not quite there and you just have to figure out a way of kind of dealing with it. And, I think I just learned the hard way, you know, I would, I remember one year at Wentworth, I was kind of not quite on it with my swing and I was, it's a pretty tough driving course there and I was standing on the tee trying to, you know, make these perfect swings, hitting high draws off the tees and it just, it was just really hard for me to kind of commit to the shots and I ended up just spraying it all over the golf course and it was just through my kind of, I just didn't manage my expectations well enough. I was, I was trying to play perfect golf without a perfect game, you know, and um, I think a big skill as a golfer is to, kind of judge where you're at you know, there are weeks where you can just kind of freewheel it and hit those neutral perfect shots and and it'll work really well but the, there's weeks where it's just not on and you've you've got to recognize that and um and develop kind of strategies and so- shots to to get you around when when your game's not there so ultimately you'll have to take the time out to really reflect exactly where you're at and be honest with yourself yeah yeah absolutely that, that's what i do well on guitar i was like yeah i'm not swinging it well but it's fine, you know, we'll hit these shots and, and figure out a way. And I think just accepting it's a big thing, you know, um, if you just accept that your game's not quite there, then then that kind of allows, it allows me anyway to to then hit all these you know, certain shots. And I'm not trying to be the perfect golfer. Um, you know, for me, you know, a big, a big part of that was just letting kind of my ego go, you know, and just not not trying to be that perfect golfer. I like that, uh, the, that word acceptance. Yeah, if you can't do that, then you're likely to be reactive, aren't you? And you're likely just to, to be in sort of fight mode, really. Yeah. And yeah, whereas if you accept something, regardless of whether it's the perfect golf swing or whatever, or just things in life, you're generally a little bit calmer and, and, and more chilled about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you kind of control the things that, that you can control. It's, it's a massive, um, massive skill, really, to, to be able to do that. Yeah. So we'll wrap up in a, in a few moments. If you were offering advice to younger players who are coming through the Alps Tour, the Challenge Tour, onto the main tour, what three takeaways would you give from what we've talked about? Well, I would say, I mean, there's a lot of answers that give you. So <laughs> I'll probably, um, yeah, one thing is you've got to, at the end of the day, you've got to have the skills necessary to, to play the level of golf required, you know, to, to win on tour and, and get to where you want to be. So it's finding ways to develop those skills so you know i would say getting a, a coach that knows what they're doing and can really help you along the way and and really committing to the to whatever plan you put together with with your team basically so that i think that's one thing i've done really well is 
I feel like I've got a really good team around me. We kind of we're in constant dialogue and we kind of we're constantly reflecting on you know my results and how my practice is going and all that and finding ways to just improve my skills as a player basically and and at the end of the day that is uh you know that's such a massive thing is is your ability to hit certain shots and dart the ball online and all, and all that stuff so yeah I would say find kind of find good coaches and good advice and yeah just commit to kind of just improving improving your game from a kind of from a skill standpoint that's a big big thing I wish I'd been kind of told when I was younger is read the obstacle is the way that was um a massive game changer for me I think just a, a great book about kind of seeing obstacles for what they are and and um just being able to handle adversity because at the end of the day if you're going to be a success in anything you're going to come up against a lot of adversity and you know I've had I've had my fair share of it and you know in golf in terms obviously not in terms of life but um yeah that just it just really changed my whole mindset to to golf I kind of I learned how to deal with kind of things that weren't going quite right um like I had a year where I was really struggling off the tee and I kind of I got to the point where I almost thought I'm just I'm just a bad driver of the ball you know I can't like it's just my thing I can't I don't drive it well but I read this book and kind of realized that yeah my driving's not great at the moment but that is that's an obstacle and you've got to deal with it and you've got to learn to improve in your driving I kind of it just totally flipped my mindset on how to to approach it and and I just yeah it, that was kind of that was my my issue my obstacle at the time and rather than like curse it and and kind of get depressed about it I did something about it and um and my driving has, has improved and I think if you if you can have that attitude with everything in life um you know it's, it's a huge thing and yeah the obstacles away by Ryan Holiday was just a massive kind of a learning point and a, and a turning point in in my kind of career I think and the third thing <laughs> tough it's question the, one shot at a time like it's such a everyone says it and that's like such a kind of broad statement but it really is like one if if you can do one thing as a golfer to be able to focus on one shot and and one thing at a time you'll not go far wrong because because what i see the best players do is exactly that and what i see the guys that struggle do is is they get distracted and they can be playing great in a tournament and you know when the cameras come then that distracts them when the crowds you know when there's more crowds all of a sudden that's a distraction if they're playing with a big name that's a distraction and and all of a sudden their their attention isn't on you know what they need to do and yeah, you look at like a Brooks Koepka or a Tiger, like it doesn't matter what's going on, their kind of focus and intensity is the exact same over every shot. And, and that is a skill that, that needs to be developed. And, you know, we always talked about strategies on how to do that during the podcast. But if, you know, if you can have one kind of mental skill as a golfer, it would be that. And then, and obviously the whole obstacle is the way thing. If you, if you can handle adversity and kind of ha- handle setbacks really well, and then, and then focus on, kind of one shot at a time basically is what we'd call it you won't go too far wrong that's great so those three things are I suppose be honest with yourself around your skills seek yeah. ways to develop them look at ways to handle adversity because it's it's a fact of life and yep. thirdly and importantly for golfers one shot at a time again try and develop that mentality yep. yeah yeah to summarize it nicely i kind of waffled a bit there but that's yeah, basically <laughs> what i was trying to say yeah it helps when you've got a pen and paper in front of you yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks very much obviously for taking the the time out at bright and early in the morning for yourself yeah i'm, I'm an early bird so not a problem <laughs> where can people find you on on social media yes i'm on i'm mainly on twitter uh i think it's chris paisley 86 is my handle maybe or c paisley one and it's i'm not i'm actually not sure yeah, but um yeah i'm mainly on twitter i'm on instagram as well don't do as much on there but yeah at the minute there's not too much golf stuff going on so i'm tweeting a lot about cooking steaks and, and all that kind of stuff so um <laughs> if you're interested in that yeah give me a follow <laughs> a nice barbecue there have you yeah yeah i've got a big green egg which has been my kind of thing at the moment is yeah grilling and smoking things on the on the big green egg so yeah, I'm a fan of barbecues as well, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you'll have to share some recipes later. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Great. Well, like, like I say, yeah, thanks again for your time, Chris. I'd like to give a big thanks to today's sponsors.
Functional Intelligent Training who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosforth near Newcastle upon Tyne and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support and excellent rehabilitation services. Thank you for listening to Demystifying Mental Toughness today. To sign up for tips and advice to help you be the best that you can be, go to wwwsport excellence.co.uk and sign up to the Mental Edge newsletter.